Hello and welcome to the Young Texas and Reformed podcast. I'm your host, Taylor DeSoto. In this episode, we're going to be dis- discussing why I don't debate textual variants. So I get a lot of requests to do videos about specific textual variants. And on occasion, I have made videos on textual variants, but, you know, like Mark 69 through 20, 1 John 5, 7, John 7, 53 through 8, 11. Uh, but normally when I address them, I try to tie it into the theological component of the discussion, which is mostly what I focus on. So in this video, I want to talk about why I typically don't address them. Uh, there, are, there are three reasons I can give, and I think that this will be helpful to those that don't necessarily understand why people have trouble with the critical text. Uh, so let's just jump into it. There are three reasons why I don't typically take the time to address textual variants. You know, oftentimes you guys will message me, hey, can you look at this variant, look at that variant. I just, if you've addressed one, you've addressed them all, uh, essentially. So the first reason is that debating textual variants with a critical text advocate is a waste of time and foolish. So as much as a critical text person loves to debate variants, they do so without any real reason. So in the first place, the modern doctrine of scripture, uh, as articulated in inerrancy, the Chicago Statement, basically mainstream understanding of uh, bibliology, this view isn't concerned with words. It's concerned with ideas or doctrines. And since they say that no doctrines are affected, Their chief argument for the authority of scripture is that the differences in words don't actually change anything significant. There's, as James White says in his book, there's, there's no major doctrinal difference between the two wildly, most wildly different manuscripts in the manuscript tradition. So this being the case, a discussion, debate, or argument over a textual variant doesn't actually matter to a critical text advocate because it doesn't change doctrine. It doesn't matter that the ending of Mark is gone. To them, it doesn't make a difference. So if you're debating somebody on the merits of a textual variant, they don't actually believe that the outcome of the debate will change anything. Even if you're right, it doesn't matter. Now, when you're debating somebody and and they're, they're not actually concerned with the outcome or they don't have to change their mind if they're wrong, right? They could be wrong, proven wrong, admit that they're wrong, and still say, I don't care because it doesn't change doctrine. I just like this reading better. It's in my ESV, and therefore I'm going to continue reading it. It doesn't matter to them. So engaging with somebody whose doctrine of scripture is like that is an entire waste of time. Secondly, debating a variant implies that an argument is being made for a particular word, verse, or passage as original or not original, which isn't actually a structure of the critical text position. Since the critical text methodology is evidence-based, and they have no evidence that ties what they've determined to be earliest to what is original, any argument that they make for the originality of a word, verse, or passage falls into the category of opinion, conjecture, or speculation. That's why they, uh, any of their conclusions are, are riddled with probabilities, likelies, maybes, perhaps, that kind of thing. So in a debate, when an argument is founded on such grounds, a counter-argument can be made from the same exact thing, from an opinion, a conjecture, a speculation, and that argument would be just as strong. For example, let's just say we're debating the ending of Mark. And they say, it's not original because the earliest manuscripts don't have it. Well, I could say, are the manuscripts you are referencing the original manuscripts? They would say, no. You continue and say, do you have any way to, con- to connect those manuscripts to the original? They would say, no. You conclude, then I propose that it is original because only three manuscripts exclude it, and it is found in the writings of the early church fathers. So the critical text advocate has no objective argument against this because, ultimately, both claims are just proposals untethered from the original manuscript. Now, you could say one is a stronger argument or a weaker argument, but none definitively prove what we're talking about here. So the difference 
between the two is theology and methodology, which informs how both parties look at the same exact set of data. The approaches are different, the outcome is different, but ultimately it's just opinion. Every single argument over a textual variant proposed by a critical text advocate comes down to whether or not they can answer the question, can the evidence you provided in support of your reading be tied to the original? To which they must respond, no. This being the case, they are really debating the age of their preferred reading, when it came into the manuscript tradition, not the originality. And to quote James White, I want what Paul wrote. Just because a variant came into the manuscript er, in manuscript tradition early doesn't make it original and in fact cannot be proven to be the original at all. It could have came in and been wrong. So if we really want what Paul wrote, debating textual variation upon the grounds of the critical text methodology and framework is irrelevant and the wrong way to do it because the critical text methodology makes absolutely no claims about the originality or authenticity of a verse. So if the purpose of our debate is to argue originality of a word, verse, or passage, then it is foolish to do so with a critical text advocate because there isn't a single argument that they could produce which would support anything in that category of original. They're, they're, they're arguing directionality. Which one came first, the chicken or the egg? And which one came first might not be even be the original. They can't prove that their reading is original or if it's even the right one. The two that they're debating between might not even be the right one according to their view. Nothing to say about the original. So quickly before we go into my second reading, or my second reason, uh, I always talk about this, the methodological gap, and I just want to make this clear as to why I'm saying that they don't have anything in their methodology which talks to the original. In the critical text framework, it is evidence-based. They're taking a look at the extant manuscript tradition, and they're making conclusions based on it. Those manuscripts are divorced from the original by a couple hundred years. The first complete ones, at least. And so if we're talking about the originality of a complete Bible, by and large, we don't have one until the 4th century. That being the case, there's a huge gap between their earliest and best manuscripts, so-called, and the original, and they have nothing in their methodology which ties their so-called earliest and best manuscripts with the original. And that is why Dan Wallace says, even if we did have the original, we, we simply wouldn't know it. Because there's no way to verify anything that they're doing right now. So the, the critical text methodology doesn't talk about the original. Nowhere in their methodology does it say this is absolutely how something can be determined to be original. Nothing baked into their methodology like that. So the second reason why I don't debate textual variants with a critical text advocate is because their arguments are almost never consistent with their methodology. If they propose that a reading is original because it is early, then we can point to their own system, their own methods would say earliest doesn't always mean best. A later manuscript can preserve a later reading or an earlier reading, which reveals a very interesting point about their system overall. And they might try to avoid admitting this, but their whole argument hinges on the fact that their select few manuscripts are early and they propose therefore best. All of their methods incorporate this bias, despite their methods also explicitly stating that this is not an absolute rule, not a rule that is true in every case, or in many cases. So their chief assumption is one that their own methods don't actually affirm as being true. And that is why most arguments for a variant or for the critical text take form on an attack of other ta text platforms and those involved in either advocating for them or creating them. They'll go to Erasmus, Beza, the reformers. Uh, they'll go to King James only as so-called. And they'll just attack, attack, attack. They're not actually proposing an argument. They're proposing a polemic, which is fine. It just doesn't prove your text. For example, they'll say, well, Erasmus had less than a dozen manuscripts. 
To which we might respond, well, there are only three manuscripts out of all the thousands of manuscripts that have your reading at Mark 16, 9 through 20, one of which isn't even relevant. See, when they make the claim that Erasmus or Beza didn't have a lot of manuscripts, they're making an argument that they don't actually apply to their own position. They don't actually think this is an argument that would disprove a text. Now, if we're talking about an argument against a majority text advocate that's advocating for like a minority reading, then maybe that would make sense. But how many people do that? It, it, they make these arguments against people are using a system that they don't believe in themselves that the other person is not believing in either. It's a total uh, non-argument. So if we should actually be concerned, if it's an actual argument that Erasmus allegedly only had less than a dozen manuscripts, then why are we throwing out Mark 16, 9 through 20, where only two, really, when it comes down to it, manuscripts have that, have the, the, the passage without the ending? If it's, if it's egregious that Erasmus had less than a dozen, why is it okay that there are only two that support your reading there? Because they don't have a majority text position. And what they're really doing is making a majority text argument. So if we should be concerned with Erasmus's alleged manuscript count, we should most certainly be concerned about the fact that the critical text is propped up on, for the most part, only two manuscripts, Aleph and B. And the same argument could be said to be true about 1 John 5, 7. The major claim is that not a lot of manuscripts have it, and that the manuscripts that do have it are late. Though we know that earliest doesn't always mean best, and that manuscript count doesn't equal originality in, from a critical text perspective, so this argument isn't consistent with their own position. See, this is the thing. When they argue against a text, the same arguments can be applied to their own text, but no one seems to care because their methodology is inconsistent and subjective, as we've heard from people like Peter Gurry. So there are more manuscripts which testify to 1 John 5, 7 than the critical text reading at the ending of Mark, to prove my point. It's nonsensical to appeal to manuscript count when they don't actually care about manuscript count. It's not a, ref a refutation of another position, unless I guess the, refu the position is the majority text position, um, when it, in the, the, the niche case where majority text re, uh, advocate is advocating for a minority reading, it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. It's not a powerful argument. They don't believe that the argumentation is actually relevant, yet they make these arguments anyway. Another example is that they might say that Erasmus is a papist to which we might rattle off all the Unitarians, cultists, and papists involved in creation of the creation of the critical text. According to their methodology, it doesn't matter who does the work of textual criticism. You've, you've heard it all the time, that God uses the heathens to accomplish his will all the time. It's like, they admit that heathens are working on their text, and they just say, well, God's using them. See, the argument that Erasmus is a papist doesn't actually matter. It doesn't matter to the TR position. It doesn't matter to the critical text position. It matters to no one, and yet they still say it as though it means something. So the third and final reason I don't debate textual variants with critical text advocates is because of the ways they appeal to authority. When you walk through the first two reasons I've supplied, the discussion almost always comes down to, well, all the scholars disagree with you and agree with me, therefore I'm right. All these men can't be wrong together. And that is true that all the scholars disagree with me for the most part, disagree with the TR position for the most part, but most of the scholars disagree with majority text too. But in this case, the scholars that all agree, they agree on this fundamental principle that we do not have now in any of our critical Greek texts or in any of our translations exactly what the New Testament, what the authors of the New Testament wrote. Even if we did, we would not know it. That's what they agree on. And if I'm going to disagree with them, I'm going to do it on that grounds alone. That should be all a conservative Christian needs to disagree with the scholarly consensus. So which is to say that the scholars are not arguing for originality of verses. And if we're interested in what Paul wrote, then we shouldn't agree with the scholars. So I'm not going to agree with scholars who say that we can't know what Paul wrote. And I'm not sure why anybody would. It's not a virtuous 
or bo thing to be boasted in that you agree with the scholars right now. They're blatantly unorthodox. So why would we agree with them? Sorry, that's a little bit too uh, individualistic. But, you know, scholarly consensuses have been wrong <laughs> a lot. And consensus doesn't always mean truth. In fact, it doesn't necessarily mean truth at all. If you recall uh, in the 1900s, all those cigarette ads, ads you know, doctors, doctors recommend this cigarette. <sighs> that was the scholarly consensus at one point. Like, there's, I mean, point, point to all the times in history where the scholars were just plain out wrong. And further, we know that appeals to authority are inherently weak and do not make an argument correct. It's a logical fallacy to say that all the scholars agree or this particular scholar has, you know, knows Greek and you don't, you know, that's an argument that like Mark Ward will make, James White will make, well, well, we know Greek and you don't, therefore, like if that works on anybody, I'm sorry, you need, you need to go to a church where they're going to teach you how to think because that's embarrassing. So one might say that the TR position appeals to authority too. And it might be true that some people do this, but in all of the arguments I have made and that I have seen made, appeals to the reformers and the reformed and the post-reformed are always for the purpose of demonstrating what those men actually believed about scripture, not appealing to them as a means to be correct. See, right now, one of the critical text arguments is that the reformers believe what we believe. And so in order to counter this argument, we quote the reformed and the post-reformed and say, actually, no, this is what they believed. And they go, appeal to authority. Again, join a church that teaches you how to think, because that's embarrassing. In order to disprove what they're saying about the reformers believing the critical text methodology, we have to point to the reformers, quote them, and say, see, no, they didn't. And that is why I typically avoid debating textual variants with critical text advocates. Because one, if the goal of this debate is to find the is to determine the originality or support the originality of one reading or another, the critical text advocates aren't actually doing that and cannot actually do that. So the whole discussion is a waste of time. It's foolishness. Now, if they want to debate when a variant came into the manuscript tradition, they can go do that in their little circles. But I'm not interested in that. It's it's boring to me. I'm disinterested in it because it doesn't matter. I want to know what Paul wrote. And I do know what Paul wrote. I, I don't want to know. I do know what Paul wrote. As should every conservative Christian that has their Bible in front of them. Two. The reason I don't debate for a critical text advocate is if the goal is consistent argumentation, we have we have seen that, that mostly all of the critical text arguments are not consistent according to their own methodology. You can look at their arguments, apply it to their own position, and see them refute themselves and their folly. And finally, when we arrive at the appeals to authority, once we've seen them thoroughly embarrass themselves, the discussion is over because we're just picking scholars for our team at that point. And debates are not won ahead of time like a playground dodgeball game by picking the biggest kids in the class to be on your team. That I'm sorry, that's just not how debates work. That's not how arguments work. That's not how truth works. So that's why I don't that's why I avoid talking about textual variation with critical text advocates. They have no reason to do it in the first place, and when they try, they're inconsistent and they can't be consistent because their methodology is not objective and is not consistent. And most of the time, people that advocate for the critical text position don't actually know what they're talking about, so they appeal to John MacArthur, to John Piper, to Metzger, to Bart Ehrman, to whoever their, their guy is, and they'll say, see, this is what this scholar said. How could you possibly disagree with that scholar? It's, well, um, let me show you why I could possibly disagree with that scholar. But they're not interested. They're not interested. So it's a waste of time. So anyway, uh, this has been an ep the, a podcast episode of the Young Texas and Reform podcast with your host, Taylor DeSoto. I hope this has been helpful.
May the Lord bless you and keep you, and we will see you all in the next episode.